Avengers, Age of Ultron is garbage, folks. Is it an alligator or a crocodile? I don't know the difference, and at this point, I'm too afraid to ask. Look at that. That is a werewolf. <laughs> What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Denny Geek Presents Marvel Stand Em Live, where each week we give you the deepest possible dives on all the goings on in the MCU, Marvel Comics, and beyond. And we are back in Jersey City again this week with another episode of Ms. Marvel, the most delightful MCU project of 2022 so far. And with me for all time and always, I've got Denny Geek TV editor Alec Bajalid. And once again, joining us as a special guest, we have Denny Geek Audience Development Coordinator, Muzna Shahzad, who ended up stealing the show last week, and she better not do it again. Kirsten Howard will be back on camera with us next week, folks. Don't you worry, but they are moderating our Twitch comments today, so you better all behave yourselves. Let's talk Ms. Marvel Episode 2. Muzna, how are you feeling? Um, this episode was more um, in detail. We get to see Kamala Khan's family. We get to see her connection with her religion, her culture, and we get to see a lot more of her friends, um, especially Nakia. Um, all in all, I do really like it. I, I think I am more excited now because we get to see uh, more of her powers and more of her more of the history of the bangle that she found that gave her the powers. So I'm really excited about the future of it yes alec how about you i enjoyed it again i thought it was a little bit of a step down from last week uh which i suppose is to be expected just because uh you get most of your good ideas out in the premiere and that's where all the energy is this one just felt a, a touch busy in a way that made me wonder if the usual marvel format of six hour long episodes and nine half hour long episodes is becoming a bit restrictive uh, just because it seems like they packed a lot into this one, you know, um, there's Eid Mubarak celebration, there's the new kid at school, there's all the training sequences, it felt a little disjointed, but at the same time, I'm having a hard time complaining about any one of those particular aspects, they're all perfectly entertaining and charming, just a bit uh, disorganized, I think, but I'll give it a pass, I still like Miss Marvel, if anything, I think it might be suited for something longer, series-wise. Yeah, I I agree. I'm we're only two episodes in and I'm already annoyed that it's only six episodes. Like I just want to spend time in this world. Last week felt almost like the perfect first act. If this was a movie, if this was actually a feature film, that first episode was really structured like that. Whereas this episode, you know, you you become more aware that it's TV and the pacing requirements are different and everything else. So I kind of understand how that is, you know, where it's like is this a TV episode or is this kind of like an extended, you know, early part of a second act of what might have been a, like a movie screenplay at some point? But I don't care because it's a blast. And like every single member of this cast is just so much fun and I want to spend time with them. And there's so much fun stuff that happens. I mean, like this might be my favorite testing a powers montage that like i can remember you know i mean for years i've been very kind of like anti-origin story where it's like nobody needs origin stories anymore and like movies that have to cram origin stories into a three-act structure it's like it's too much now like people know what superheroes are but it feels a little different here and this felt like fun and special and playful and i just uh i don't know i love it i'm really into this show and uh i'm i'm excited to see just how far along in Kamala's journey they're able to take us, um, you know, in the span of six episodes. We do get some more revelations about those powers, in particular when Bruno thinks that the bangle is not the source of the powers, but more that it's like activating something. Um, and there's a lot of implications about that. Uh, Muzna, you've read more Ms. Marvel comics than I have, I believe. So why don't you speak to this first? Um, so the bangles and Mike, when we talked um, in the last episode, I, I said that I didn't want them to kind of make her power with this bangle, this alien object, this ex external thing. Like 
um, for me, her powers had always been like she always had it. It was just lying dormant, for example. Um, and you see that confirmed when Bruno says, oh, um, it's you. It's just channeling that power um, outside. Um, and with with the bangles, they've always they've mentioned it in the comics, but it is mentioned as an accessory. Um, she wears it um, as part of her costume, and it is um, Aisha's, who we'll be talk uh, about in in a bit. But um, it is her great grandmother, and she uh, you, uh, wore those bangles and uh, went through partition. She fled um, India to come to Pakistan. Um, so all of that is part of her heritage. It's just that they've kind of made it into like, oh, this is a, a thing that kind of ignites her powers or brings it out, outside. Um, so I do like that they're playing on this. I am very curious to see how that bangle is um, kind of uh, connected to Aisha, because in my head, if if she has the powers and she channels it, what if like any of her family members is to wear that bangle? Would they have powers? Would they... Um, also have like these powers lying dormant and they don't know about. Um, I do definitely think that when they talk about in the partition story and they mention that um, when Sana, who's uh, Kamala's grandmother, when she's lost as a toddler during partition, um, she follows the stars. So that's kind of hinting towards the fact that, you know, those powers, they look like stars when she's like walking on them. Um, so it, it might be that it was her mother, Aisha, who's who who kind of like kind of told her kid to like go this way to find her father just like follow the stars um so i'm just really excited to see like what they do with it i'm i'm really happy that the powers are not external they're not like the iron man suit um because that was that was always the the thing miss marvel kamala khan was kamala khan because she always had that inside of her um, I don't know if they're going to play on the inhuman part still, um, if that's something that they bring it on um, later on, that some ancestor was inhuman, that's how it's carried down. Um, but yeah, I, I, do, I do like the, the play on it. I do want to see where they take it with her heritage. We addressed this a little bit last week where, you know, people were upset about just how drastically they changed her powers because like, especially in the early uh, Ms. Marvel stories, the nature of those powers is so key to her journey as like, not just a hero, but as a person, but they're finding other ways to nod to that here. You know, I mean, there's a moment that's right out of the comics where, you know, the powers are manifesting on her nose randomly, almost like, you know, almost like, like a, like a zit, you know? So it's like, I, I kind of want to see, what this what this might mean for the future. Kirsty is asking, does anyone want more in human stuff in the MCU? That's a very good question for the audience. I mean, like, for me, the answer is no. Um, but I'm also saying that as somebody that like has very little patience for the inhumans in the comics as well. Um, like Ms. Marvel, Kamala Khan is one of the only good things to come out of Marvel Comics big inhuman push from 2013 2014 2015 where you know the idea was they were kind of using inhumans to replace mutants in the comics because of you know they were hoping that this would become a thing in the mcu uh, a lot more than it actually uh one you know a lot more than it actually ended up happening and it just was not great it just didn't work out and it felt really really forced and fortunately we got ms marvel out of it you know but like like it definitely felt like inhumans were being crammed down everybody's throats for a while. Forget the inhumans. It's time to start introducing mutants in the MCU, you know? Um, and yes, what about Lockjaw, my beloved Lockjaw? Lockjaw is an exception. Uh, I, uh, I will hug Lockjaw anytime Lockjaw appears. I think that three second moment in which Bruno just shows her her heat signature on an iPad is like the most important part of the series thus far. Um, Having not read the comics and not uh, not necessarily knowing how crucial the nature of Kamala's powers are to her as a character, and just coming in this cold as a TV watcher, I felt like that moment spoke volumes um, and was really useful for kind of establishing emotional core of the character and empowering her. And I like that it comes with like a technological perspective as well. It's it's a lot less. 
I don't know, corny than someone saying the power was in you all along. And then someone just literally showing you like, no, dude, like, look, it's the power. Like I'm showing you. <laughs> um, I like that. And I'm also wondering, like, I wonder if shield or sword or any of these various superhero organizations do similar uh, testing on their heroes. Cause we've not really seen that before. It's just funny to me that this high school kid, thought was like the first one we've seen who was thought to do like an infrared testing on his buddy you know if if kirsty were here i would get in trouble because anytime we talk about well actually what if the powers were just activated like we kind of saw that a little bit in wandavision right where like it was very strongly implied that wanda's powers were not a result of the experiments that were done on her and pietro by, uh, you know, by Baron von Strucker in, in Avengers Age of Ultron and before, you know, and to me, if the powers are inherent and there's no other explanation, that's a mutant, folks. And um, it would be pretty funny after after that whole kerfuffle in, you know, uh, in the 2010s about Marvel Comics trying to use Inhumans to replace mutants if uh if kamala ends up being like a stealth introduction for mutants in the mcu it is a harebrained theory on my part i admit so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go too far down this road especially because i know kirsty will roast me about it until the end of time if i do so <laughs> it, <laughs> see right there it's a, it's not a mutant and it's not a werewolf and i know andrew is also sharpening his knives and i probably deserve that <laughs> uh, <laughs> um sir you know I don't know if we should talk more about the family history now, Muzna, or if we should save some of that for the end of the episode. Like, how much of that do you think is relevant here? Um, I, I think we should save that for comics because there's um, a lot of stuff that I can mention with the family, um, with Delp Deeper. I would say that the one thing about power I would like to mention is um, I want to see if she can have her power without the bangle after she gets full control of it. Or does she have to depend on it throughout? Um, that's something that I'd be interested in. Um, and to the inhuman point, I don't, I don't, Kamala Khan being a huge MCU fan is not aware of the inhuman stuff because the first thought she has is Asgard, like mm. I'm an, an Asgardian. So I'm assuming maybe they've just like completely erased that. <laughs> everyone's memory they're just like they don't exist but um yeah I, I i'd be interested to see how, how they handle that yeah code monkey just said it's mephisto and mm -hmm. uh as one of the guilty parties who helped propagate every mephisto theory under the sun during wandavision uh uh mia culpa and also i can safely say that it is not mephisto this time uh <laughs> Bruno is uh, is a fun character, uh, even though like I feel like there's a little bit too much of of Tom Holland's Peter Parker in him. Um, but I also appreciate how they're kind of trying to lean into like the Michael J. Fox and Back to the Future vibes with him and stuff. But his crush on Kamala coming more and more to the forefront, especially uh, you know when jealousy involved is involved, is is really kind of fun and. Um, it's different. It's, you know, it's appropriate, but it's also a little bit different than the way it plays out on the page in the comics, you know, but I think, I mean, you know, speaking as a dude who was once 15 years old, like, I think a lot of guys have that realization when it's like, suddenly it's like, oh dear, like, you know, I have a crush on my best friend and Oh, but I'm just not the dude. And uh, <laughs> I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm not the guy. Like, you know, and I, I, I have to feel for him. And I appreciate thus far that he's at least, you know, he's handling it as maturely as a, as a 15 year old, 16 year old could, uh, probably better than I would have at that age. So, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's a nice touch. I just got to feel for the guy. He's a fellow Italian, you know, like I got to, I got to give it up for Bruno here. Poor guy. <laughs> it's funny because in the in the car scene when um, when Kamran mentions Bazigar and he's like, oh, I've seen it too, and I thought it was very pleasant. And if anyone has seen Bazigar, it's not pleasant. It's about <laughs> a dude who, who murders a bunch of people out of revenge. So I'm just like, yeah, that was just it was hilarious how he said it like that. Um, and and with him and and Kamala, uh, I like in the comics that 
they address his feelings, but they also have this one scene where her brother, who, because it's kind of obvious that he has a crush on her. Everyone in the world knows it. Apparently, Kamala probably also knows it, but she's is not saying it. But so Amir kind of talks to him and kind of says that you will not be the boy that Kamala's parents would approve of because um, you're not Muslim. Also, but that's the major part and also not Pakistani. So that's one of the things that they would consider. And he's very bummed out about it. That was a very sad scene because I shipped them. I shipped them very hard. Um, so that was just as sad. I don't know if they're going to bring it up in the show, but that was a really cute exchange. But yeah, he's he's hilarious. Yeah, no, I feel bad for the kid. My, that, that's a that is a, a very big truism, Mike. Like that's a that's a crucial part of growing up as a, a young American male. It's just like understanding that like you, your your girlfriends don't see you like that, bud. I promise. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I like that angle it brings. The, the the more hormonal nonsense we have in a story about teenagers in the MCU, I just feel like the better it is. Um, that's a crucial part of growing up. And that should be a crucial part of the series. I will say, though, I mean, so help me God, Bruno, if you don't take that Caltech um, internship thing or that fellowship, whatever, whatever it is they pay for your food, you've got to take it. You know, last week, I know I compared the vibe of this show to Spider-Man Homecoming and, and you know, and, and uh, Far From Home in particular. And if we're talking about uh, hormonal nonsense, as Alec puts it, that does kind of bring this into that far from home realm. And that was another MCU thing, not only like a fun depiction of like teenage crushes and, and everything, but also like a remarkably like, like a remarkably healthy one at times like you know um you know in particular like the ned and betty stuff like you know when they break up at the end of 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 far from home and like i kind of hope they follow that trajectory here where it's like we can celebrate the uncomfortableness and like and sometimes just the the ludicrousness of of these teenage relationships without it becoming melodramatic and also like some in some cases like i think the rom the romance in far from home was like better than 90 percent of the other romantic pairings than we, that we've had depicted in the mcu so far uh you know so let the kids show everybody how it should be done. <laughs> I know there has been some uproar about the 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 differences between like how certain friendships are depicted and how certain characters are depicted uh, on screen as opposed to the comics. And that's the kind of conversation that is absolutely kind of like above my pay grade because when it comes to the cultural elements of Ms. Marvel, I am the first to admit that my understanding is, you know, my enjoyment of the show when we get to those points is surface level. And my understanding of those elements is, is even less so. So Musna, do you want to walk us through some of some of this? Yeah. Um, so one of the, the issues that I had watching the show was about Nakia's character. Um, in the comics, she she is probably the probably my favorite after after Kamala Khan. She's just um, such a feminist, she's an activist, she's so confident in herself and everything, and also confident uh, of where she comes from, her heritage. Um, and in the show, um, they've kind of changed her ethnicity, which is a big, big problem here. Um, so in the comics, she was Turkish, and it was very, very uh, big, big established in the first issue where uh, Kamala kind of teases her about her nickname, the American nickname that people of ethnicity usually keep to make it easier for people to, you know, address her names. Um, so she kind of establishes that she's very proud Turkish, but in the show, they hint at her being half uh, white. To be honest, I can't speak for tur the Turkish community, Turkish people, but I will say if this happened to Kamala Khan and she was shown as half white, half Pakistani, I would be angry. Um, so all of the backlash that it's getting, it, it makes sense because I don't understand why. I don't understand why this was needed, why they had to do it. Um, there are rumors that they possibly did it because of the actress herself, but that feels like that, that's no excuse because you could have easily found a Turkish person who is also hijabi. Uh, I don't 
I, I think my biggest question right now is why they had the need to do so, because that's a big character. That's just changing someone's identity. Um, and I have a problem with that. Unless they address, they kind of make that a necessity in the coming episodes, like they connect it to some, something that happens to Kamala or something that happens in general. I'm kind of disappointed in this, like, yeah. Do you think it affects the way uh, she relates to Kamala as well? Um, not in the way that she relates to Kamala, but I will say that, you know, when, when she talks about, you know, uh, I am too white for, um, like the, the ethnic people. And then I'm, I'm, I'm too like Turkish for, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm too non-white for other people. Like I, I see that they're trying to make sense out of that with Kamala. Um, I see their friendship as the same right now, but of course, when you're, you can't deal with the same issues. Do you see, like if you're half white you still have that kind of privilege um, that carries with it. Kamala doesn't have that privilege. So even if you're a mixed race in that, you, you still have those, those uh, that a higher status in society, in American society, especially. So I would say that there's kind of a distinct, well, they, have, they haven't established it in the show right now. Um, I would like to see if they address it, address it at all, but I will say there's, there's, a, there's a cultural status difference here. Fair enough. I mean, like, this is like, you know, th there was uproar about this before the show even aired. And I have to confess, like, I, I just, you know, I was I was not equipped to to fully absorb it. You know what I mean? And and so I'm glad uh, I'm glad that you're able to take us through this, uh, because, again, like, you know, I have Bruno. I have my my Italian representation on screen. I, I don't I, I don't even know. I, I don't even know if if uh, if the actor is uh, is Italian, but it's not the same thing, you know, and uh, and folks have to remember that, like, you know, look, my whole life, my heroes have all looked like me, you know, and uh, I think we all have to be aware of that and be sensitive to that as, you know, as the MCU continues to rightfully diversify the kinds of stories that it's telling there's another new character that we meet though one who has tremendous implications uh both in the moment and for for the future of the show and that's Cameron, uh who has a terrific introduction like and is just such a, a great character out of the gate um I can't help but feel, as is often the case when characters are given this kind of intro, that he's a little bit too good to be true. Alec, wh what do you think, as as the uh, as the other fan of uh, hormonal nonsense <laughs> on this show? Before before we turn this back to Musna, I don't know why it's up to me to talk about Comrade. <laughs> um, yeah, he's 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 a real beefcake. <laughs> that's guy. not what I meant. Like, <laughs> that's not what I meant. Um, I don't know. What did you mean? I, I didn't know. know. Just <laughs> <laughs> I meant in <laughs> it's it's chaos here on Marvel Standom today, folks. I apologize. Uh, it's no. I meant because you know we were talking before about just the 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 fun teenage vibes of the show, and and Cameron's. Uh, intro kind of throws a monkey wrench into a lot of these things and 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 changes the course of where we thought things were going yeah no i do love it i mean like him in particular he kind of goes back to my original point about like this episode doing too much just because he i would i wouldn't have minded like if he was the central figure of this whole hour because you know like the mysterious hot new boy coming to school is like a fairly big deal um but he has to kind of awkwardly fit in amongst uh, Kamala discovering her powers. And then he like disappears for a while before he and then the driving test and he comes back at the end. Uh, but I love the energy he brings. Uh, and I love that it contributes to this aforementioned hormonal nonsense. Um, <laughs> you know, we were talking about how like the kids seem to do romance or I guess for lack of a better word, horniness than the adults in Marvel uh, properties. And I feel like it's because for them, like it's really life or death. Like there, there's like the, Kamala literally just discovered that this bangle unlocks supernatural powers within her. And look at how quickly she drops training 
<laughs> for, for, <laughs> for cultivating those powers just because there's a new hot kid who wants to give her driving lessons. Um, that's just kind of a fun universal truth about teenagers. And I like that Miss Marvel's tapping into it. And it's, I, I think it's perfectly logical. I, I don't think it's um, hyperbolic for, for her to just kind of drop her superhero training at a moment's notice. Cause uh, this kid wants to give her driving lessons. <laughs> now, Muslin and I have to tread carefully because look, it's apparent by the end of the episode that there is more of this guy than meets the eye. So that element of it is not a spoiler, but needless to say, this he's going to be a, a central figure beyond just being, you know, the the thorn in Bruno's side uh, over the course of the next four episodes from the looks of things. Um, Muzna, how, how do you how do you feel about uh, about Cameron here and, and his intro? Um, I actually loved his intro where he um, bumps into her. It's very like I would I would say Bollywoodish. Like you, when you meet the hero, it's kind of like either you bump or his um, your dubatta, which is like a stole that kind of gets stuck to his watch or something, and it's really cute. Um, but with the pool scene and they had the jalebi baby by Tashir playing in the background, that was like like uh, Alex reaction. Like he's. He's great. He looks great. Um, so I understand all the like fire emojis, like hundred ones coming coming around him. Uh, he is mentioned like he is a big part in the comic, especially like um, volume one. Um, in in the comics, though, he was family friends with with Kamala Khan's family. So he used to live with her uh, till he was about five, and then moved to Texas and then came back. Um, that was kind of. Uh, the the story and I wouldn't go deep into it, but Kamala is also smitten by him in the comics. Um, so I, my radar when I saw him the first time, I was like, this is too good to be true. There's there's something going on here. I don't know what it is, but it feels like for me, or maybe I'm biased because I love Bruno and Kamala. Like I'm just like I don't like you. Like I, you're hot, but I don't like you. Um, so I'm just like. I'm waiting for what happens. I do want to discuss his character in the comics more later on, but um, yeah, that's going to be a different episode because I don't want to um, spoil it for everyone else. Um, but yeah, he the way that he interacts with her, the car scene that also happens in the comics where they go together and they drive, um, his brother meeting them, which is, I, I don't, he's as goofy as he was presented in the comics, like his brother, because this, this Kamala is saying that this is your, this is our cousin. And he's just like, sure, I accept it. He's like, daram.com, Kamran. And I'm just like, really? Really? Are you, are you, how, how is this making sense to you? Um, so yeah, it was a fun scene. I do, I do like his introduction. Yeah. And it does lead to, well, there's two other things to consider. Like, first of all, just in that party scene, there's another moment that is right out of the very first issue of Ms. Marvel. Um, you know, like this party is a little closer to what the discovery of the power sequence was in the comics, you know, where it's like a more traditional high school party than what we got in episode one with AvengerCon. Um, and, you know, it's the moment where like that, that jock dickhead just like hands her, like, you know, hands her a solo cup and it's, and it's orange juice and vodka. But like, even that dialogue is like verbatim from the comics. But then like they pivot away from all of that to do Cameron's introduction. But that to me sets up what might be my single favorite scene in either of these episodes so far. And it's the dance sequence to the Ronettes Be My Baby, which is the last thing I expected to see on any Marvel show um and i just i don't know that's one of the greatest one of the greatest pop songs of all time you have the great hal blaine on drums you have the recently departed ronnie specter on vocals and like it's just it's a masterpiece and and seeing it in that context and how perfectly charming Amon Vellani is in that scene i just i just couldn't get over that what i was watching uh it was really great 
I mean, it, it's a it's a South Asian show like India, Pakistan, and of course there's gonna be a dance number, and of course someone's gonna say they mentioned DDLJ and they mentioned Charu Khan, and there's a there's a literally a song in that movie where the girl is just like fantasizing about her Mr. Perfect, and she's dancing around her room, and that kind of resonated like here. I was just imagining her doing exactly the same thing that the actress was doing in the movie. So um, honestly, this feels like right out of like a Bollywood flick. Would yeah. Yeah, what my favorite little detail is after she gets the the Capri Sun, uh, the the product placement is on point in this episode. When she gets the Capri Sun out of the fridge, and 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 she's heading back like to the stairs. If you look in the background, like you can see her mother look at her father, like 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 they're not even in focus. Like they are clearly like you know. Like, you know, the, the lighting effect is back on and they're not in focus at all. And you could still you could still understand the look that they exchange. And it's just so good. It's so much fun. Yeah, that, I mean, that that's why we do this whole TV and movie thing like well, that that's showing not telling like that, it's, it's so easy to just say like and then Kamala was very attracted to the handsome boy. But it's it's another thing entirely to just do like a whole dance number around it featuring, like you said, Mike, one of the greatest pop songs ever written. Um, yeah, I mean, like that's that's worth the price of admission. That's why you sit down to watch these things in the first place for the most part. At least why I sit down to watch them. We should probably just talk a little bit more about, uh, oh, great, Kirsty is correcting me. Uh, we pronounce it Capri Sun here. Capri Sun is sending me. No, but it's Capri Sun, right? Like, like Capri that was Sun. that's what the commercials always told me. The now I English want is one. Wrong. Yeah, Capri Sun. That, that's that's really bizarre to me. But like, all I know now is I really want a drink pouch. Uh, you know, and we are still accepting sponsors here on Marvel <laughs> Fandom, folks. So uh, if any representatives from Capri Sun or Capri Sun, if you want to spend your advertising dollars and pounds. Hit us up. We talked a little bit about some of the comic stuff. We should talk more, though, in relation to the other mysterious figure who shows up here. Um, Muzna, why don't you take us through a little bit of this? So the mysterious figure is actually Nimra Butcha, and she's amazing. She's a Pakistani actress. Um, and she, so her in that role um, is not mentioned in that comics. Like, I I've, I've didn't read anything about um, this like uh, Kamran's mother, for example, they're shown uh, like very slightly like parents, but they're like side characters in the comics um, with her character. And she's rumored to play Najma. Um, I don't, we don't know anything about who she is, but uh, from what the TV show had showed us, I think she might know Aisha or she might have a connection to Aisha. She definitely knows that Kamala um, has the bangle. Of course, she's Miss Marvel and everything. Um, but I also know that she's probably going to be a negative character because one of the clips that Marvel released, um, I think it's titled Courage, um, and you see Miss uh, Kamala fighting her in that. In that, So I'm assuming there she isn't great. Um, also, you can tell because I don't know if anyone got goosebumps when, when she sits in the car and um, you hear her say Kamala and you you literally have goosebumps. There's like this this person is saying the name like really like evilish way. <laughs> um, so I, I, I had, she's a great, great actress. So I, I think she's going to be phenomenal on this. But um, yeah, this, this character is literally completely a mystery um, in the comics as well. I have no idea but i'm hoping hoping that Najma, uh, nimra bucha does justice to it she's she's great and there is of course another um you know broader mcu connection here when uh kamala and kamran are talking about uh you know they're talking about movies and stuff like that and of course kingo from the eternals name comes up and i think that is like my favorite kind of mcu connection you know when somebody is mentioned outside of the context you would normally associate them with you know kingo's career as you know as a movie star is of course a running joke in eternals but like here he's just like casually mentioned as you know movie star and a sex symbol which i thought was really uh was really a nice touch i honestly thought this was because my my mind has erased everything the Eternals like 
that movie I, <laughs> i was just like you know like complete erasure so um when she said kingo i just assumed because they were talking about shahrukh khan previously i just thought because he's known as king of bollywood i just thought that was a play on the word king I, i i it took me a while to connect oh no this is this is kumail nanjiani the person you have forgotten was in the eternals but um yeah i i did not connect it that way yeah have you done a second viewing of eternals and and i see we have uh arnav i hope i said your name right in the comments uh giving the thumbs down to eternals and saying hot garbage uh ha, ha, i i do suggest Everybody give that movie another shot because I did not care for Eternals either, but I I got more out of it on the second viewing. Uh, Kirsty, who is here in the comments with us and should be on camera with us again next week, uh, wrote an excellent article about it for denageek.com uh, about why you should check out, you know, why Eternals deserves a second viewing. So I know that movie wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but I do think it <laughs> says I got it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I got more out of it on the second viewing, and I, I, I do think history will be kind to it. So, Muznan, if you haven't tried it yet at home, maybe, I don't know. I, I'm going to try, Mike. It will take a lot for me to, like, really start that movie. Every time I see it on Disney, I'm just like, nope. So, I, <laughs> I'm not doing this. But, uh, yeah, because Kumail Nanjiani, he's, he's great. Like, I, I enjoyed his character in the movie, but just in the general... Um, but anyway, this is not an internals review, Miss Marvel. But um, <laughs> he, he, yeah, he was when he was mentioned as Kingo, I had complete, like, I completely dissociated him from the, uh, from the MC, like MCU, and I was just like, okay, that's that's interesting that people got onto that because I did not think it think of it that way. Any final thoughts before we wrap it up today, folks? Any questions from uh, from our chatters on Twitch here? <laughs> oh yes yeah, An andrew is reminding us of all of the ant-man stuff in this episode and you know it's interesting because so we will have another article from delia, ha delia harrington going up on denigeek.com uh right after this episode breaking down uh, all the marvel and mcu references that we don't have time to talk about today but one of the things that delia gets into is just how important Ant-Man seems to be to Kamala. And it, like he he kind of replaces, like in the comics, she's a Wolverine super fan, right, Mazna? Is that usually how that works? Yep, yep, she is. She's a, and Wolverine actually shows up in one of the issues where, and he helps her train. So there's like Bruno is in there. He actually helps us train and and they fight alligators. It's a, it's a really fun, fun issue, yeah. But here, like, we get kind of a meta joke about Paul Rudd as well. Uh, <laughs> and about yeah. how the dude does not age. He um, does. He sincerely just looks better. Like, as yeah. he gets older. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so remind me, even though I just watched this episode for a second time, like an hour ago, when Kamala and Bruno are talking about like and we're both char you know because we're both charming and look a lot younger younger than we are is she talking about scott lang there or is she talking about paul rudd aren't they the same person there i think she's not talking about paul rudd she's talking about scott she's talking lang. about scott okay yeah. so that's great right. that's like it <laughs> she said uh, i think i read this just like what makes you think i have ant-man powers she says, that's it look younger yes. than our age yeah yeah that's it so that is that's a wonderful meta joke just kind of like conflating the the real world pop culture narrative about Paul Rudd with Scott Lang in the MCU, you know? And I also kind of like the idea of Scott Lang not being like, you know, every MCU hero is, you know, they're all either 35 or 16 or, you know, they're immortal. They're Thor and the Eternals, right? But like, I kind of like the idea that like, you know, maybe Scott Lang is like 50, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, imagine, like, their response would be the same as ours. Like, like, imagine, like, because they've known, you know, Paul Rudd or Scott Lang for five, six years. The moment you find out he's 50, they have to be just as astonished as we are. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that one throwaway line of dialogue in this episode just becomes like 10 times cooler. And it's just like another, another feather in this show's cap for all the legitimate criticisms that we have about this particular episode as an episode of tv the even more legitimate cultural criticisms 
uh, that folks have regarding the treatment of some of these characters, at least for me, this is still very much exactly the kind of like thing that I want in the MCU. And, uh, and I hope they can maintain it for the next four episodes. Yeah, and I and I like that they nod to the comics a lot, even when they've changed Kamala's power. Like this episode was heavy on comics Easter eggs, like literally like the mosque scene where she kind of confronts the sheikh, um, which like we can't hear you. That's straight from the comics. Um, that line that she says, and that's I I love that she says that. Um, and then talking about like with Aisha in particular, and they mentioned stars. Um, when in the partition scene, when she's um, pregnant and she's going, um, fleeing her country to go to Pakistan, um, she kind of starts praying because she's really scared and thinking like, oh, what if like uh, my daughter isn't safe? Like, I, I just want God to give me a sign. There's like literally a shooting star in the sky. And then she she kind of calms down. She's like, oh, really? Like, is it going to be OK? Is this, is this a sign? It kind of is a nod to like, uh, in the show, it, her powers are very cosmic. Like they look like a star's light, for example. So I, I like. I would. I don't know if that's what that was deliberate, but I would like to make a connection with, with, with the with that shooting star in the in the panel that in the comics. You guys aren't gonna believe me, but I swear to God, this is the truth. Um, I had a dream last night, and I think I was. I dreamt about Miss Marvel because I knew I was gonna watch it again this morning once I woke up. But I had a dream last night that I was watching the Miss Marvel season finale. And the last scene of the show was her doing her driver's test again. And she used her powers and hit the gas too hard and hit the car in front of her and it exploded. <laughs> and everybody cheered. And then that it went to credits. <laughs> I, I, I had that dream last night. Oh, my God. I If, if this is a prophecy, Alec... Uh... <laughs> We may have to rethink several things, but like, yeah. <laughs> like we may, this will change we to, Standom forever. <laughs> yeah, this will this will change the balance of power at Den Geek for one thing. Uh, like it would explain a lot. It would explain a lot of Alex's talent as TV editor. Like you know, so <laughs> may all of us have our own uh, you know latent inert superpowers activated in the coming weeks and months. That is my summer wish for everybody. Uh, here with me on Marvel Standom today, and all of you watching and listening right now. Um, and I think on that note, I think that is it for this week's episode of Marvel Standom. We will be back next week, unless I die of COVID, with more <laughs> from the world of Ms. Marvel and beyond. And don't worry, we are gonna cover Thor Love and Thunder when it's time for that too. Uh, make sure you're subscribing to us wherever you're listening right now. And don't forget to check out our web home at denigeek.com where you can find all our Marvel coverage. Drop us a line. Let us know your burning questions, what you want us to cover in upcoming episodes. We don't always have to stick to just the episode of the week, folks. We can do some other stuff too. We are at Marvel Standom on Twitter and Instagram. Give those a follow. We'll have some surprises there one of these days, but it's a good way to get in touch with us. Don't forget, we also have a DC show. So check out DC Standom when you can on all major podcast platforms. The latest episode features an, imp- an uh, uh, yeah. the latest episode features an interview with Bruce Campbell himself. And uh, where else are you going to get that? Nowhere, folks. If you came in late, you'll be able to watch this entire episode on denofgeek.com or at our YouTube home, Den of Geek US. Don't forget, you can check out past episodes there and also wherever you get your podcasts. Muzna. Thank you once again for joining us. I hope you'll be back next week and every week thereafter. I think it's going to Muzna's head a little bit. Like we like there's already a Muzna standum logo. You know, <laughs> like what do you want to do? You want to host the show? You want to take my job? Fine. Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Muzna standum is coming next week. So uh I hope everybody's ready for that too. No, seriously. This is this is amazing. We're we're so lucky to work with you every day at Denny Geek and I'm glad you're joining us for the show now. Uh like you you're really great and I'm glad world is getting to see what we get to see at Denny Geek every day. Um Andrew Halley, our best producer, our incredibly patient producer, our very talented producer, makes this show everything it can be. Uh, Denny Geek social media coordinator Lee Parham is not here today, but make sure you're following our TikTok at Denny Geek TV, where Lee does great work. Special shout out to Michael R for handling all the podcast stuff that makes this show reach all the people it can. And most of all, 
Thank you all for watching, listening, following, subscribing, all that good stuff. Remember, folks, we stand together. We'll see you next week.